Hi, Barney. Thank you so much for coming back. Absolute pleasure. Enjoyed the last one. Looking forward to this one. Right. So episode five. Um, let's start right at the, at the very start of it. So one of the biggest challenges, I think, when you're working with dinosaurs is that of conveying scale. And in the opening scene to episode five, you have what I think, what I saw, was that you progressively scaled up from the the little macro details of a dung beetle. We start in right in its face, and then we slowly, step by step, like take steps backwards and, and eventually scale to what an adult sauropod in the background. So is scale a tool in your storytelling or is it a limitation? It's both. It like scale is what everybody default wants to know. How big is it? Like, wow, that's, you know, like how tiny, like what, what can I compare it to? Is that like the size of a swimming pool, the size of whales, whatever those ridiculous things that documentaries usually throw out as kind mm. of tools of reference. And exactly the same with these dinos or with any of these prehistoric creatures. Uh, a lot of the comments were like, oh, how can we get a better sense of how big it is? It's massive. Like, what can we see? And the hard thing is, is that there is nothing in the ancient world that gives you true scale. There are no screaming humans running away and hiding from those dinosaurs to give you that reference point. There's no car or Jeep getting squashed that makes you realize just how big that leg or foot is or like what we have are rocks, cliffs, maybe even mountains or maybe trees. But you, at the same time, this is a prehistoric world. Maybe the trees are like 10 times bigger than they, I've heard about some of those insects being much bigger than they are today. Like, like all those references are kind of not there. So it's hard. It's really hard. And some of these creatures, I feel like we maybe didn't convey as well as we could have just how big they are. Because I remember looking at some of you, like not our behind the scenes, but like if we would put in, when we were filming these scenes, we had to get some kind of reference from the for the camera operator to know just how big this thing is. So we would often walk around with these giant rulers or with cardboard cutouts or anything we could or even just crouch under a tree and pretend to be that animal <laughs> uh like we did for the Deinodocus. But it it was it was sort of somehow much more obvious when there's a human in there because your brain instantly clicks into what size that thing is. You then sticks a prehistoric creature in and you you have to use other cues. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. The opening of that show, we wanted to play with that. We wanted that to begin with, you're right in on what could be some, I don't know, you're kind of not maybe exactly sure of the scale because you're right in the face of a dung beetle and it's sort of like this transformer, shiny robotic thing that then sort of stomps off. And then obviously pretty quickly you go, okay, it's a little dung beetle and it bumps into what looks like a kind of a big, kind of dinosaur sauropod type thing but then you're realizing that that's actually just a tiny one and actually the herd in the background are vast and 100 percent, that is in many ways why we love dinosaurs but also what makes them sort of amazing is they start in eggs the, and eggs are limited there's only so big an egg can get because of the i don't know the thickness of the shell and then the need for air to to move through that shell so they've got to start small and yet they were the largest animals that ever walked this planet and you're like wow that's nuts when you really think about that like what how big they have to grow in a normal lifespan of an animal that's remarkable and it's I think that was one of the things with this episode because it's broadly focused on the era of the dinosaurs was trying to find those aspects to dinosaurs that people didn't really know about or maybe just hadn't really thought about. Maybe they knew about it. Everyone knows a sauropod is giant, but you don't really think about the fact that it had to hatch out of an egg the size of a grapefruit. It's like, what does that entail? Whoa, how did they do that? And so that was definitely a, a, a driver for me was to 
give people what they wanted. Obviously, you click onto a dinosaur episode, you, you want to see some big dinosaurs running around doing dinosaur cool stuff. But at the same time, I wanted people to learn new stuff or to, to be surprised or intrigued or sort of like appreciate that there was a lot more going on back then. So yeah, it was a, it was a challenge. It's an exciting episode to do because it's the dinosaurs, but it's also a challenge because there's a lot of expectation there. Yeah, so you have your dinosaur episode. This is the dinosaur episode. And we've got a big dinosaur introduction, but then you just say, right, excuse me, please, please just wait here. Now we have to talk about plants and angiosperms. <laughs> how, how difficult a decision was it time to ring fence that time to talk about plant genitals, essentially, and when you had, you know, like the the potential to show more dinosaur scenes, to show everything that the dinosaur fan base would want. For me, this is what I love about Loop, Life on Our Planet. It's telling the whole story. Like, it's not a dinosaur series. Like, we are telling the story of life. And so many more things happened that actually resulted in the dinosaurs that if you understand them suddenly your appreciation for dinosaurs for me or certainly i hope goes up because like you realize that they're not in an isolation they're not in a kind of a make-believe world which is like oh here's a planet filled with kind of crazy dinosaurs it's like no it's this planet it's it's the one we're on today but back in the past and the reason that they came about was because of stuff that was happening despite them or around them. And one of the most influential things that happened on our planet in history, I would argue, obviously others will disagree, was the evolution of angiosperms. I mean, it transformed the planet. And I loved that that was a story that I could tell around dinosaurs. It's, it's not what you expect, 100%. You turn up and okay, we gave people a little bit of a like, this is what you came for. Here's a kind of crazy allosaurus and a sauropod in the rain. Cool. But then it's like, but there's there's a lot more going on in this period. There was like huge, massive, just hugely influential things happening that were completely dictating what was going on as far as evolution goes. And angiosperms were right at the front of that. You know, with the arrival of the angiosperm, life transformed on the land. Certainly, you went from, uh, well, you'll know better than me, but conifers, you know, like the sort of the, dare I say it, more dull looking plants to complete crazy variety, color, form, function. And of course, with that, you got all the insects, the whole food chain just transformed. And I love that that was a story that people wouldn't think about with the dinosaurs. Usually people are so busy telling the dinosaur story that they, that they don't know that or they don't have the time or they don't want to look into it. But on Life on Our Planet, like that was fundamental in helping the diversity of dinosaurs. It, 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 it was such a crucial part of what happened to our planet. And so I love the fact that we could take the time to properly explore that. Yeah, and as well, the Hymenoptera, the social insects, um, I, I love that scene. It showed me things about arthropods that I didn't know. So when they were taking uh, the ants back to give them medical care and their ants' abiotics, I was just like, no, they didn't. And then <laughs> you show it, and I was like, oh, they did. I didn't know that. Like, Great. this is amazing. Yeah. Like, I can't believe that that is something that, so these insects do they look after each other with with medicine like this is unbelievable yeah and that's that is what this series celebrates is life no matter when it lived whether it's today in the past it like life is incredible and always has been and the adaptations that life finds to to find a way uh it, you know that is what makes it exciting when we can capture those moments and bring that out as part of our story and you getting a sense that yeah okay dinosaurs arrived at here like, cool they're great they're big they run around they do like dinosaur things 
but also like flowers were arriving and then insects and like you say social insects and just that whole other world that is all coming together basically everything we know and recognize today as wildlife kind of had its first feet in that mesozoic era and i love that like not many people are sort of aware of that that basically by the time at the end of the dinosaur age you kind of had everything there all the major players are kind of finally on the scene and then it was like okay well what's going to happen next who's going to come out the other side of this giant rock that's about to hit us so when i think about paleontology documentaries and i'm i'm thinking about dinosaurs in particular i always get a a vibe of them being say like in colorado in the summer nice summer's day hanging out by some nice conifers it's kind of dry it's kind of sandy it's always in the middle of the day in the summer in the warmth and i mean earth is 50 percent in darkness on average and it rains and it's cloudy and it's windy and so the scene with the allosaurus and diplodocus in the rain like that for me felt different it felt more real in a way because it actually had weather in there and and surely it must have been you know like quicker and easier for um industrial light and magic to make a scene that was in the day that was in uh in pleasant conditions and good lighting so why why did you feel that you had to show that and uh, spend the additional budget on you know just making it rain <laughs> making it rain um it felt like that sometimes spending the money um for exactly the reasons you just outlined like so many paleo documentaries are shot in a desert with a couple of monkey puzzle trees or a like a conifer on a nice sunny day and the main reason for that is that making good cgi vfx creatures and making them believable it's hard and it's expensive and so you can save a lot of costs if they're walking on solid rock or you're not having to get rid of grass that hasn't evolved yet or you know things are lit nice and crisp and clean and then that you can light your animals crisply and cleanly and they can sit in that environment much easier so all these factors are what inevitably because of the constraints of not having bottomless pits of money the the producers and directors like myself go through it to and you kind of have to make those compromises and go well i'd rather have a cool looking creature do something cool but take a hit on it just being on a lovely sunny day in like you say colorado or something um <clears throat> but i but that for me is again what i came back to with this dinosaur show is like okay so what have we not seen them do where do we not normally see them like and also what's the reality of the world like the reality is that it was a forested filled with ferns it was wet it you know like you say things don't always happen in beautiful sunlight and we don't often see them in the paleo world like that so let's go for it like it was the challenge that i i loved about it it was can we do this is this possible and then technically how are we going to do it uh, and that wasn't easy at all and it I left it uh, to basically be my or well, one of the last VFX scenes I did because I was like, okay, I need to kind of get the basics done. And in Ep Four, we had Lystrosaurus in the desert, which is, if you like, a more classic way of seeing a dinosaur. But I like that because it 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 wasn't just because we needed to; it was because that reflected the story, the era they were in, the conditions that that animal had to survive. But when it comes to dinosaurs, they're living in like a pretty lush world. It's it's pretty amazing. It's kind of, it's a gorgeous place to live. And that's why life proliferated. It was happy. Um, so yeah, I wanted to push the bird out. I wanted to see what we could do. Um, I also loved the idea of leaning into those 
you know, sort of Easter eggy type things of what we've seen in the Jurassics where, or horror movies where it often is raining, there's lightning, there's scary things in the dark. This sequence was very much about that kind of cat and mouse sort of the stillness, the kind of hunkering down, whether it's in the kitchen in Jurassic Park or uh, I think in the Jurassic World one, they were in the end of the corridor. But also there was a beautiful reference I found of a, a deer fawn um, hunkering down in the grass while I think it was a coyote was stalking it in this long grass. And just the behaviors you saw there with this coyote just trying to use every sense available to find is there something out there is there food for me that i can feed my family out in front of me and the camera operator i don't i can't remember which series it was but they'd they were focused on this tiny form trying to stay as still as possible looking so cute and so vulnerable and it was just there's amazing drama storytelling there that also reflected our bigger story of if you hatch from a an egg the size of a grapefruit, you're pretty small and vulnerable. And so you've just got to eat and fast, but you've also got to be able to do that on your own because no adult the size of a double-decker bus can look after you. They're not going to, there's no parental care. They're not going to feed you. You've got to find your own way. And there's some scary things out there in that forest. And they are, if you like, the classic sort of prehistoric monsters that we've all seen in the movies. And so it was nice to be able to play with all of these kind of influences, bring them all together and create a scene that I love. Actually, it's one of my favorites in the series. Um, I I feel that Allosaurus, if I had to say, is my favorite model in it. There's um, a s- part of that scene, it just walks past the camera and you see it's um, sinuoid, sinu- sin- sinu- no, what's the word? It's all wiggly. It's it's <laughs> yeah. as it comes through. Its body, its tail are, are all shaking, are waving as it walks past. Then it just feels so real. Uh, the light, the the rain, the texture, everything in there feels more than I've ever seen in any model, whether it be Loop or whether it be any other documentary. That for me felt the most tangible and. I, wow. I really like that. So uh, did it did it take a whole load of extra work for industrial light and magic to do? Because so, like the the surface luster, the shininess changes. Was it just simply a case of turning the lights down and the shininess up on the computers? <laughs> if only it were so simple. <laughs> um, they. The, the what I, one of the things I love about industrial and light magic is they love the challenge. They're they're I, I, they are as geeky and passionate about the subject matter and about pushing the boat out, about trying to do something remarkable as we are. And so they knew it was going to be a challenge, the sequence, but they wanted that challenge. They wanted to take it on because they they could see like just like I hoped that the results could, had the potential to be really great. Um, but it meant more work because for sure, like every plant you see that is in front of that Allosaurus is a layered blue screen plant that we shot separately, you know, and has then been put in and, and each of those plants that were shot against blue screen to be layered into there, we had to wet with a hose so that it it was already wet because you can't just have a dry plant sort of Mm. stuck in a scene when it's raining similarly we shot it all on a gray overcast day in the uk so luckily that wasn't too tough and then they had to layer in the rain on top because if you shoot it on rain and then put a cg creature on top then you have to put more rain on top of the creature and then mixing the real rain with the artificial rain you know there's chances there that Mm. it's going to not work out Um, and then of course the creatures themselves, they did actually have to kind of do, I think it's called wet maps for them. So essentially it's knowing that 3d geometry so that if you, for example, pour a bucket of water on its head, it would then know how that water would dissipate down the body and flow over it. So that when it's raining, you're getting drips in the right places. It's sort of 
pooling where it should be. It's it's reflecting in what light there was. Um, so it's it's levels of detail which had the potential to go so wrong, and yet I'd, I'd like to think looks awesome. The the one thing that I worry about, and it always happens whenever you do a scene that's in the dark, the dusk, whether it's natural history, drama, or VFX, is that you're at the vagaries of whoever's watching it, what their computer or their TV screen is set to. Because some people, their screens are super bright, bright oversaturated, and it'll look, and people, they'll watch it on that and go, oh, it's way too bright, it looks really fake. Other people will be watching it on something and the brightness is really down on their laptop because they've just been, I don't know, they didn't want to wake themselves up. And they're like, I can't see anything, it's so dark, oh my God. So it's you're, you're trying to hit some kind of sweet spot in the middle and it means that some people will be just like, oh, it looked rubbish to me. But I hope uh, that most people will see it and just be like, wow, that's that's cool. That isn't what I'm used to seeing on these in these kind of documentaries. Yeah, and I think um, and my cat's just joined me. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, get out get out the microphone. Nobody wants to hear your opinion. Right. Um, I think I saw the raindrops coming off of the face of the Allosaurus, and I was there thinking like. I don't think I've ever seen that before. And then, yeah. yeah, I don't think I've ever seen rain in a documentary before. Has, like, you must have looked at this and I can't think of anything. Has there been a rain scene in any other documentary? Ooh. A dinosaur one? Uh, I'm sure one of your audience will be able to pick out. I, I think one. there might be. Right in. <laughs> um, I wasn't aware of any that, that were obvious ones. Uh, and certainly not if there are, I don't think, I'd like to think I, that no one's gone to the attention to detail that ILM did. Because like mm. you say, there are moments when you see it splashing off its nostril or a drip falling off, you know, the underside of its jaw. And so much of that they do and no one will ever notice. And it, you almost wish people had more time to stare at these things and see them because you're like, wow, they have really gone to town and it is beautiful. And so believable, and yet that shot lasts whatever frames, a couple of seconds, whatever. It, and most people are so busy in just the drama of the scene, which is great, that they're not going to notice it. But it's those little things that really help sell a scene, and especially something as complex and difficult as as a rainstorm in the dark. Yeah. So attention to detail. Um, that is going to be a, a huge part of episode five. So we've got dinosaurs and you know that if you've got dinosaurs the paleontological fan base is gonna stick it under the microscope it's going to be all over social media within a week there's going to be uh youtube videos made left right and center analyzing them rating them showing up all of the issues that people see so were these the most important organisms to get right in the whole series it's it's really tough because the whole world of dinosaurs is so scrutinized like you say people are passionate and i love that but it means they have pretty strong opinions um and they're 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 very quick to leap on the tiny things that perhaps could have been better and it i think people somehow feel like oh we as program makers don't care about that or aren't putting as much effort as we could but ultimately you try your hardest with the resources you have and the knowledge you have to get it right i mean we really did and like you say with dinosaurs more than anything else i mean all our animals you want to be as believable as possible but it it is easier with lesser known creatures because they haven't been depicted before they maybe aren't as studied less is known about them so you can be more speculative because there's there's less knowledge there is less of a a black and white world out there of what people perceive is correct or incorrect about the tiny minutia of how they looked, moved, or you know, were I don't know, body muscled, sculpted, feathered, haired, lipped. Or, there are so many. 
things that the dinosaur community, the paleo community loves to debate. And we knew by sticking some of these creatures out there, they were going to get scrutinized. So 100%, we tried our damnedest to get them right. But there will be things that people will disagree with, without doubt. And there are things that I look at and wish were better. There are some things that we tried that I don't think quite worked. Um, if I'm really honest, I don't know if I should say this or not, but um, basically with Deinonychus, early days, I, industrial light and magic said that they'd been experimenting with iridescence in, in feathers. And I was like, wow, imagine an iridescent dinosaur. How incredible would that be? And so we sent them off the path of trying to do that. And unfortunately, iridescence is really freaking hard to get right on screen mm. in a CGI character. I mean, it's one of those marvels of nature that the human eye even looks at and doesn't quite understand what's going on. So to replicate that on screen in, in VFX, and so for me, if I'm being really critical, I think the Deinonychus sometimes doesn't embed into the environment because of that, because ultimately iridescence actually flattens a surface if you look at what if you actually look at what it does. And so all the normal tricks that they would do to light and shadow dark feathers to make that creature sit, it, it never quite worked. And so we dialed back what the iridescence was, but it was inbuilt into the model itself, I think. Um, and so if I'm being really critical, you know, it's one of those things and that I look at and wish maybe I hadn't taken that path. It was it was a carrot too big and juicy for me not to resist, I suppose. <laughs> but it, there are limitations. And, you know, VFX today is incredible, but in 10 years' time, it'll be even more so. You only have to look back through the last couple of decades of VFX work on series like this to see just how quickly it progresses. Um, so, yeah, there are... There are always things, and and inevitably you run out of money. Like there are things where I would be going, no, we 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 must change this. It's it's not good enough, or it's it, the paleo community is going to react. I know they will, but someone's going, look, there's no more money, and like you can't just endlessly tweak on something that a very small proportion relative to the population at large around the world who are going to watch and love this series. There's a there's a small population that are going to know enough to truly care and much as we would like to please each and every one of them we're not going to be able to like we mm -hmm. have to make decisions that will upset some people so god did we try but i don't think we got it right all the time um but i defy anyone to actually get it right all the time and and create something that moves the average joe that couldn't give a monkeys about it like you want ultimately this story to be an amazing story that captures hearts and minds inspires people to love the natural world to be obs as obsessed as we are with the the creatures that lived and walked on this on this planet and that's ultimately the game if, we, if we're getting even halfway there then then that's a win so yeah as we've been mentioning the the Dinosaurs are going to be the focus. They're going to be the thing that is most scrutinized, uh, definitely most discussed. I've already seen, you know, like these discussions on social media. And yes, I'm in a, a like a, a paleo social media bubble and I'm more exposed to this kind of analysis and critique and all of that um, with all the other paleo creators out there. Um, I just wanted to know. Uh, to ask um, whether or not the series is going to, well, the reputation of the series, the focus of the series, is it going to hinge around the Mesozoic episodes? Is that right? And did that put a whole load of pressure on you for carrying the, the series and, and what will be the reaction of the paleo community focusing just on the Mesozoic. What I love about the series is that it, it does cover everything. We look at the tiniest microbe through to 
today's humans in app eight, like where we are today and the beautiful culture and wondrous things we've created, as well as the downside of what we're doing to our planet and everything in between. And so for me, that's what is ultimately the strength of this series is that it is the story of life, the ups and downs, the successes, the demises, those extinctions, the underdogs. It's a real tussle between life and there is beauty and wonder at every stage of it. Some of it happens to include dinosaurs. And that's awesome. And that's very cool because they're embedded in the true narrative of what actually happened. And I think well, I'd like to think that for perhaps the first time or one of the first time, I never like saying the first time because someone will always go, oh, someone else did it back then. But, you know, what feels to me like the first time, you're getting the context and the story of how dinosaurs fit into the bigger narrative of our planet and life on our planet. And so, yeah, 100% dinosaurs are important. They, they get the attention. You only have to look at the way Netflix are promoting and advertising it. There are some cool dinosaur stuff. But interestingly, they're also leaning into the Smilodon, the, the terror birds. The, they're, they're, they are a massive crowd pleaser and a draw, dinosaurs are. There's no denying that. And so to ignore them is foolish. And to ignore their power to get eyeballs onto the screen is foolish but i'd hope that once we draw people in with those they then get taken on a, a ride that they didn't know about that tells them a much broader picture we have at least i don't know 50 percent of our shows are today's creatures and i think that'll surprise people i hope it won't put people off because in reality, I think that balance actually really helps. I think seeing where those creatures ended up today and the beauty and variety of what they've managed to evolve into really helps the whole story of life on our planet. And so you get some of the crazy creatures from the past that we don't recognize, but you also get some of the crazy creatures from today. And it's that blend that I think it really makes this, this series unique. And it's what I love about it. And in a similar vein, you end this episode with two T-Rex face to face. It's going to be the bloody fight scene that, you know, the paleo fan base want. I mean, really what the paleo fan base want is uh, T-Rex versus Spinosaurus. Who wins? You see that <laughs> kind of conversation so many times. And okay, here we could have the blood fest, but you choose to end it on courtship and more of a, a tender scene, a loving scene. Why did you choose love instead of war? <laughs> Good question. Um, well, it's a, a deeper moral for us all there and maybe it reflects me. <laughs> uh, um, I think fundamentally with this episode, I wanted to show the other side of the dinosaur world. So whether that was the fact that flowers were evolving, whether it was looking at the small, cute little mammals that were scurrying around beneath their feet or the insects and the social insects giving medicine to each other. In a similar way, I didn't want all our dinosaur sequences to be bloodthirsty predation, predation sequences, sequences where it's just kind of, the the one aspect of these animals that that is well represented in the past and to be fair is well represented in our series um f1 if you like does do what you kind of want it's got the t-rex triceratops battle and so i was like okay i want to do something different with ours we've got you got to have t-rex in there like much as i'd love to just have the crazy obscure animals people would be like so disappointed if we just ignored T-Rex. It's kind of like, who are we to deprive people of getting a T-Rex? <laughs> but at the same time, can they do something different? And and interestingly, I think around the time we were developing this, that paper came out about the neural endings that they suspect are there in the jaw of a T-Rex. And I'm pretty certain that Prehistoric Planet and, our, and myself both read those papers at the same time 
and went, you know what, this would be cool. Let's see T-Rex in a different way and have them caught. Um, because we both ended up making very similar sequences and people will kind of go one copy the other. The reality is we both know how long these things to devise, create, storyboard, film, the VFX work. There's literally no chance that one of us could have copied each other. And yet we both ended up with very similar sequences. And I think for the same reasons, we wanted to show T-Rexes doing something that, that would surprise people. Um, that would sort of enamor them. They're not just toothy monsters. They were real creatures. They had to find a partner. They had to find a mate. They had to procreate. That's as much part of life as finding food. And so I loved the idea of having this tender side to them that we could reflect and then pulling the rug out from underneath because the world explodes in the asteroid. And again, that's something that has become a trope. People, I've seen it on the internet. People are like, oh God, the uh, KPG, the, you know, the extinction event. Again, do we need another asteroid hitting the earth? But it was a big event. And it's mm. something that you can't, you can't sort of ignore. And so it's then, okay, how can we do it in a way that feels new, that we're learning new stuff about what actually happened and surprising people. And so for me, it was a great way to sort of cliffhanger end that sequence. You know, you just finally think, A, you're surprised that they're not just launching into each other. Because also, what would that have been like? Two T-Rexes come together. They are big, toothy, muscly things. Like you only have to look at lions mating or any animal. There's a lot of tension initially when there's like okay what's going on here are we competing for something are we fighting over meat are we or are we gonna court and like how's that gonna work and do i want to is this dangerous is there like a praying mantis vibe going on here where we might you know mate and then i'll eat your head i don't know and so we wanted to play with that inevitably but then have as you see in so many birds, even alligators, like there's that tenderness. They rub together. It's it's a courtship dance. And how does an animal that big do that? What have they got in their armory? And like, how can they display to each other? And so there were lots of looking at different animals and what they do with sort of lizards nodding their head, some things waving their tails, other birds doing different things. And trying to work out, okay, you've got something that big, that bulky, like how can it, it wants to show its strength to be a, a worthy mate, but at the same time convey some tenderness, like I maybe won't eat you, but I might if you go the wrong way and or attack you, maybe not eat you. But it, it, there were lots of lovely emotions for me to play with, but the challenge is then getting the VFX animal to make that believable. Mm. you know getting a it's it's one thing to get a vfx animal to run and walk realistically it's another thing to actually get it to kind of convey a change of emotion from like dominance to fear to submission to love to affection like they they don't smile they don't talk they don't like raise their eyebrows like you you've you're very limited on what tools you've got. And so it was it was a good challenge. But I, I loved it and I love I love that sequence. I think it's I think it's beautiful and it and it really came together when they started putting the sounds in, working with the the noises that they that they might have made, trying to avoid the roars. I mean I'm super aware that T Rex roar is one of the most hated things uh <laughs> on the paleo community. And but I thought, well, when do animals roar? They don't roar when they're about to attack something because that then notifies your prey that you're coming. Like no animal does that. That's stupid. But what they do is they do bellow to each other to go, I'm looking for a mate or, hey, I'm like a big ass male. Like, come find me. I'm, I'm worth checking out. And then often in courtship, there are vocalizations. And so it felt like th it was justifiable that they would vocalize in that way we tried to make it not a roar but to give it a more sort of deep rumbly acoustic that could sort of vibrate through their body more like an alligator might with their bellow um but at the same time if they're unsure and i'd like to think you see that with the female when she's like i'm not sure if you're a worthy mate what are they going to do if they don't 
take that kind of approach nicely, they are going to use their most visible thing to go, I don't like you or like stay back, otherwise I might attack. And that is their teeth, their mouth. They will gape and essentially vocalize in their face because um, they can't wave their arms and scare people. <laughs> so so it was it was nice to be able to give, if you like, the punters what they wanted, which was a toothy T-Rex, but I hope justify it in real behavior so it wasn't just scary T-Rex run, running around the forest roaring. It was a justifiable behavior that this animal could have done that makes sense in the natural world that you you do bellow, you do vocalize to attract or or to scare off others. And then you then see them go through these emotional changes to then leading up to the point where they are nuzzling with their sensitive snouts, who knows, um, before they potentially mate. For me, I didn't need to see them mating. I think prehistoric maybe took a bum steer there because like, who needs to see animals humping <laughs> in the forest? But hey, each to their own. We just wiped them out with an asteroid before that happened. Yeah. Um... Yeah, it's, it's lovely uh, to see how much consideration uh, has gone into all of this. I mean, for this episode and the last that you've uh, been talking us through. But as you said, a, uh, a big rock has just hit the Yucatan Peninsula. And uh, I think it's time for us to go and dig a hole somewhere and uh, hunker down for a while. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much for talking us through everything. No, a real pleasure. A real pleasure. It's great to speak about this. And I'm um... Uh, you know, it's really lovely to be able to convey how much we do try and think and plan and and get it right. I think often people assume we sort of blithely just heading out there and doing what we want, but we are trying to make this as good as possible. We want everyone to love it as much as we do, um, and it's a challenge. Maybe we don't always get it right, but uh, yeah, certainly the intention was there to make it an awesome series, and God, I hope you all like it because I certainly do. <laughs>